Hello and welcome to Contemplations. I'm here with Josh. Hello. And we will be talking about uh, conformity. And mm -hmm. that is a topic that I'm really excited about because it's something that has obviously far-reaching implications into basically everything that's happening everywhere. And we will be looking at some studies. We'll be thinking from a bit of a technical point of view and not just the classical uh, obedience and conformity studies but also kind of neuropsychology which i'm really excited about and and i know you are too so well yeah it's my my favorite stuff that the kind of biological things are my, my bread and butter because they're always able to give you more conclusive findings about things than experiments because there are so many different variables in a, a lab experiment it's difficult to take mm -hmm. the findings at face value whereas with neuroscience the the explanation is normally the only physical possible uh reason for something mm -hmm. happening therefore you can be more certain in your results which is great really yeah so um I, i'm focusing just on conformity but i understand that um quite often when you learn about this sort of thing in in psychology it's often done in tandem with obedience as mm -hmm. well but i wanted to look at conformity in detail instead and um, what was the real difference between the two i mean technical one like i've got, I've got an mm -hmm. idea but uh, how, conformity how is more to do with um your your group or your peers and it's just adhering to uh, certain norms mm -hmm. or um, things things of that nature. I'll get into exactly what it is. Um, it's not too different from the lay definition at all and obedience is more about um, being given orders from up above someone who mm -hmm. you perceive to be in authority. So um, lots of the classic experiments have people in lab coats or things like that like I, I'm a scientist and I'm telling you to do this thing. The, the, of course, the classic one is the study by Milgram where he had a, a scientist come in and just like, yeah, you need to deliver electrical shocks to people. And they went up to uh, near lethal and above lethal levels in some cases um, because they had this scientist saying, okay, it's, it's fine, I'll take responsibility for it. So people were willing to um, take that risk yeah. because it was on someone else's head. Listen and, to the experts. Well, yeah, that's pretty much what they did. Um, but anyway, en enough of that. That could be a topic potentially for another day. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to focus today on conformity, which um, you can... The, the lay definition is relatively the same to the psychological one. So I've just got the one from uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, which defines conformity as behaviour or actions that follow the accepted rules of society. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's pretty much all it is. Fair enough. It doesn't need to be really society in general because you imagine something mm -hmm. wide, something where you don't necessarily know all the people, but mm -hmm. it can be your social group or group of friends mm -hmm. or something like that. So it's got an inherent social element to it. Yes. yes. It, you can't really conform when you're on your own. Yeah, well, but, but I mean the opposite. In, it doesn't have to be the whole society. It can be a smaller group or something. Of course, yeah. Uh, it, because the way that it's defined here, it, it might mm -hmm. sound like it's only when it's the whole society doing something mm -hmm. well, then that is that comes no, as conformity. Most of the, it's not it, like that. Most of the experiments I'm looking at are looking at a, a small group of yes. people. So it also makes sense because society. that's where you make, can make good experiments in. Right? Of course, yeah. So much of the research into conformity comes from the kind of realisation that after World War II, there were um, lots of people in the German military that were clearly not um, quite as evil as some of the leading uh, mid-century Germans. I'm saying that just so uh, YouTube doesn't nuke the preview. Um, but yeah, they, they realised that you know, that there's got to be a certain amount of good people who are made to do bad things. And how, how does that happen? How does a good person do bad things? And they assumed um, that there were lots of underlying mechanisms. Obedience mm -hmm. is certainly one of them, but also conformity as well. Okay. Because, of course, there are lots of examples of people not being explicitly told, yeah, you have to do this thing, but they, they knew that there was uh, an implicit um, expectation for them to do so and that was enough they didn't actually need the formal orders mm. and that would be a case of conformity so I think that's that's what Hannah Arndt famously talked about in the banality of evil you know that's her concept mm -hmm. um, and she was she was saying that well you have these people that did horrible things during the second world war and if you look at them they're not kind of evil masterminds what they are is just like normal people that are banal mm -hmm. that that's the main characteristics that that you can see in the banality mm -hmm. and that's why she called it the banality of evil but because that's 
evil is so romanticized in culture usually that you can you often associate someone really evil with mm-hmm. someone really kind of kind of I know if very, you're American, it'll be cartoonish. English or German. Yeah. <laughs> like quite often, they'll have a mustache, probably quite twisty, and they'll be relatively intelligent and well spoken. That's yeah, like it's going to be really cartoony, right? But mm-hmm. uh, in in reality, it's like normal people like being relatively normal, but being evil in that normality and in that banality. Mm-hmm. That's that's what she famously talked about, and yeah. so I think that's what this is about as well. Mm-hmm. And there are two different um, concepts of the kind of underlying mechanism that. Um, conformity relies on um, which um, looks at social influence which of course um, conformity is also reliant on because it's an inherently social thing so this was defined all the way in 1950 which of course makes sense considering it was post World War II Um, and it was researched by Deutsch and Girard um, which the study is called a study of normative and informational social influence upon individual judgments and they made a distinction between two different kinds of social influence, and that is informational social influence and normative social influence. And you can probably deduce um, what they are, but I'm just going to read a a quick definition of each of them. And it's not a particularly complex idea. Mm -hmm. So informational social influence happens when people change their behaviour to be correct in situations where we are unsure what is correct. We look to others who are regarded as better informed and model our own behaviour upon theirs. This may mean copying someone you perceive to be more intelligent or more respected than yourself. Yep. So this isn't inherently a bad thing, I don't think, because... That's listening to the experts. Well, not necessarily, because you could, you could start a new job and you don't want to be asking lots and lots of questions. Yep. So you look to other people who know what they're doing. I know, no, that's what I'm saying, they're the experts at it. But that, that phrase is tainted know, forever now. I know, I know, I know. It, it, that's why I said it. You're putting up deliberate hurdles for me. <laughs> um, no, no, no. It can be legit, of course, but mm-hmm. then if you know that this is happening, you can easily take advantage of it and for your own purposes, for your own goals, and to present someone as an expert while mm-hmm. they're telling someone what to do, um, regardless of expertise or not, right? But yeah. they're telling what you want them to tell someone Mm -hmm. and they're going to listen because they see them as authoritative. But I don't see the informational influence side of things as particularly um, dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, that there can be an element where it can be manipulated, but people are just looking to others to see how to act in the absence of having the correct information. So it's not as bad. Um, People do it all the time and I think nothing of it. And I'm I'm very much uh, kind of, hard on people who conform. I, I consider myself a bit of a, a non-conformist, believe it or not. I, you know, hard to believe, but um, it, it kind of frustrates me when people conform a lot of the time. So I'm, I'm not defending it for any kind of uh, personal reasons. I just think, bun. Oh, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the, the second form of influence is normative um, influence, which of course comes from social norms and Normative influence originates from a desire to avoid punishment and to gain rewards, going along with the rules, even if you don't agree with them, which can also be called compliance, of course, and um, behaving in a certain way to get people to like you. And this is something that I like a lot less um, and I'm a lot less sympathetic towards because there's an inherent amount of dishonesty um, in this, isn't there? You're you're doing things to get ahead, Mm -hmm. even though you're not presenting yourself in an, an honest way. So how is this different from obedience, the the normative influence part of, like, mm-hmm. we've got the two, and so how, does it, how is the second one obedience, different? Obedience, uh, it's understood that there's a certain amount of authority involved, because to be obedient, you have to have someone above you telling you to do something, whereas this yeah, but, but, is your, your peers, right? But you're saying that it originates from a desire to avoid punishment and to gain rewards. And to, but it like, doesn't have but, to be a top-down punishment. You okay, can, but, but to be able to punish someone, you need to have some power over them. Mm-hmm. So there is hierarchy, there is authority. Well, there, there's, it, hierarchy and authority are inescapable in all aspects of human society. I know, society, so why is, but the, it's not, why is it different from, from obedience? Um, obedience kind of is understood as it being the, the top-down authority thing, whereas mm-hmm. normative influence can be from your peers, people who would otherwise be regarded as equal in status or in the hierarchy to you. Okay. And that's that's the way that it kind of neatly cuts up. But there, there's a lot of overlap, and I, I get your point. No, I, I guess I was confused in that, like, when you're equal with someone, that 
usually not in a position to punish you for something or mm-hmm. to actually enact punishment on you because they're your equals. Well, look at um, a school. Like your your peers, mm-hmm. your your equals, uh, are quite often the ones that are the most punishing towards others mm-hmm. who they, they deem to be behaving in a certain way. Yep. Um, no, fair enough, that's a good example. Yeah. I was just a bit thrown off by, by that. You know? Okay, yeah. sure. So... The first experiment, very simple one, um, this is pre-World War II, just to show that there was research going on, it wasn't mm-hmm. just, um, but it's only very small. Uh, it's uh, Jeunesse's 1932 experiment, um, where he asked participants to estimate the number of beans in a bottle. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't know how he, he managed to design such a complex experiment, but um, he, he asked the participants to estimate individually and then he got them in a group and got them to do a group estimate and then got them to guess individually again mm-hmm. and on average the estimates shifted from their original figure to one closer to that of the group. So was that the same people who had... Who like, had... Um, they'd so, gone through each of the conditions. So they right. estimated individually and then they were put in a group with other people who had also estimated, and then they estimated again after doing the group so stuff, the, and then they shifted their uh, original estimate yeah, to that yeah. of the group. Or so it would be the same it. people guessing three times? Yes. Right, okay. So that's just a very basic experiment, which um, shows that it has its roots pre-World War II, and mm-hmm. I just wanted to throw it in so I'm not misleading people. But so it's not the, the uh, main focus here. What was the difference? How much did they change on average their guesses? I'm not, I'm not, not going to focus on that. I'm okay. going to look. I've got some numbers for some more robust experiments Fair later enough. on. Fair so I, I just wanted to brush over this one yep. because it's very old, and you know the, the methodology has changed since then. So the the kind of classic one that everyone goes to is the the research of Solomon Ash in 1951. Um, I think you're probably already familiar with this study, I, I think, I remember you saying so. I think I've seen it, everyone's probably seen it. Yeah, so um, this is pretty much what you learn well, when you start learning psychology in school. Everyone's so gonna... at least seen it, the mm-hmm. picture, right? Even if they don't know the yes, background. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, so Ash recruited 50 male participants from Swarthmore College in the United States. I don't know where that is, um, but I don't think it really matters. Um, and the participants um, were placed, uh, they went into a room and they were placed on a panel of people and there were seven stooges on this panel. And what is a stooge? Well, it's someone who is in cahoots with the experimenter there. A fake participant. They're, they're a paid actor, mm-hmm. um, to use uh, different terminology. But yeah, they're, they're in on the experiment and they're there to mislead the participant. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this case, they were looking at a bunch of lines, which we have on screen at the minute. So they have a target line and they've got to match it up in length with line A, B or C. Mm -hmm. And one of the lines, of course, matches up to it. The other two do not. Um, Relatively simple. You'd think it's um, something that nobody could really go wrong with. So um, yeah, like it's pretty clear. It's not like it's ambiguous, which is the correct mm -hmm. line. Yeah. I mean, anyone with a, a working pair of eyes would be able to see. Yes. So, um, of course, the the stooges who were in on the experiment would answer first, and then the the real participant would be the last to answer. Um, so they did this a total of eighteen times per participant, and the uh, the stooges, or also they're called confederates. Mm-hmm. Um, gave incorrect answers in twelve of the eighteen trials. Um, which are referred to as the critical trials or the experimental trials. And I am throwing in lots of um, research methodology terminology, but that's not really important. You don't necessarily have to focus on that, but it's kind of tidbits. But don't worry if you if it's getting a bit too wordy. That's not the important thing. The ideas are the underlying important mm-hmm. thing, of course. So out of the uh, critical trials or the experimental trials where they gave the incorrect answer, um, the participants conformed on average 32% of the time. Mm-hmm. Which That's is obviously not a majority, but it's not an insignificant amount either. Yo, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, this, this is quite, quite clear what the right answer is. And so you would expect everyone, like if there was no, um, mm-hmm. no influence whatsoever, they would just give the right answer, obviously. Uh, but so, so, so any amount of, any amount of wrong answers is, indicates conformity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, of course, that's that's more or less it. Um, I think when they ran control trials to see just, you know, how difficult is it, I think under 1% of people got it wrong, 
Mm. And uh, I think it was just that must be the one percent of people who have undiagnosed uh, short sightedness or something. I don't know. Well, trolls. All that too. Yeah, they didn't take it seriously. Who knows? But um, 75% of participants conformed at least once. So mm-hmm. that means that maybe um, I would imagine that if they conformed once, it'd probably be like, hmm, that's strange. Okay, I'm just going to go with it. And then as time progressed, they're like, actually, these people are stupid. I'm going to do something less. fishy. Yeah. yeah. So you would assume that, okay, um, that maybe people conformed at the beginning, mm-hmm. although it's not necessarily implied. Um, but 25% of the, the participants never conformed once. I mean, I would I imagine that if I was there myself, mm-hmm. um, it, of course, it was the early days of these types of studies, so people didn't really know what to expect necessarily. They right? weren't um, and so, told it was a research into no, of conformity. Course, of course, of it was not. about um, visual of course not, perception, but, that's but, what they were told. But, but now, now when, when someone... If someone would give you something like that, you would mm-hmm. be like, "Yeah, something like they're not telling me something, right?" Because you you're familiar with that type of research that there's uh, there's many studies in which mm-hmm. the researchers are, are not telling you something deliberately. Right? I've done that myself with my own research. But, um, but um, in the fifties, mm-hmm. it would be something quite new, and people wouldn't be used to it, right? Mm-hmm. And so if you if you were to give people this, they would be like, "Yeah." Um, I guess they want me to look at something, you know, um, which is something that would be really sus today. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah, it. they're probably not having me here just to look at lines. Like, that would be quite weird. That's, that's a good that's point. Not, because, that's not yeah. enough for them to drag me here mm-hmm. and pay me. The the kind of amount of work that has to go into deceiving participants in a modern experiment is very high, and also yeah. the ethical barriers, believe me, are ridiculously stringent. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.